Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our first BCBH lecture series of 2022. Um, a couple housekeeping items if you haven't attended before. We have a chat and Q&A open. We will take uh, questions at the end of today's presentation. You can put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and this is also being recorded and will be available on our website or YouTube channel in about three to five days. Um, and slides will also be available on our website. Uh, CME uh, credits are available as well, and you can find that information on our website, and I'll post that information in the chat. And um, we're really delighted today to have a man who needs no introduction, Dr. Leonard Epstein from the University of Buffalo School of Medicine. Um, he'll be presenting behavioral economics and exercise reinforcement today. Dr. Epstein, is an internationally recognized authority in the fields of childhood overweight, physical activity, weight control, and family intervention. He received his clinical uh, psychology PhD from Ohio University and has held positions at Auburn University, the University of Pittsburgh, and finally the University of Buffalo beginning in 1993, where he still is today. Um, we could dedicate this whole hour to Dr. Epstein's achievements. He has conducted research for more than 25 years on the prevention and treatment of childhood obesity and has had numerous uh, positions on editorial boards, guest reviewers. He was the editor of Behavioral Medicine uh, Abstracts. Uh, he's been a consultant and done grant review work beginning in the mid-1970s. His research has been funded by NIDA, NCA, HRSA, and the National Institute on Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases for decades. So without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Epstein because he has a wonderful presentation prepared for us today. Dr. Epstein. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I first want to start with the story. Um, so recently, in Buffalo, we got two feet of snow. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, we got some snow. I can go out and play in the snow. I can cross country ski. I can run in the park with the snow. And I just had a smile on my face. It was just the best feeling. Um, and, and it reminded me of a, of a time when I, I was at NIH and I was giving a talk invited talk on exercise. And there were several of us speakers at this little mini conference. And I talked a little bit about Ted Garland's work. Now, Ted Garland um, is a physiologist from UC Irvine who's done work on selective breeding of, of rodents, primarily mice, um, for physical activity. So he looks at a, a group of mice and he takes the ones that are most active in terms of running in a running wheel, and then he breeds them versus controls where they're just randomly um, selected to breed. And he's done this for 45 generations with the idea of trying to figure out the, the physiology um, of what makes um, voluntary runners. Um, <laughs> so after my talk, uh, um, one of the people came up to me who was there um, and she said, you know, I used to be a research assistant in Ted Garland's lab. And one of the things I remember was when we would put the mice, the, 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 the mice who really chose to run a lot um, into their cages with their running wheels and they started running, we could just see them smiling. <laughs> so I thought that fit me perfectly. Exercise is something that I love to do. And I'm gonna talk about that um, today. And usually when we think about reinforcers and reinforcement processes, we often think about bad things, drugs, alcohol. Um, here I'm gonna talk about how we can think about making positive things more reinforcing. And I'm gonna be using behavioral choice theory as, a, as an underlying um, theoretical construct. And, and by the way, when I present my slides, I tend not to read the slides. <laughs> I think you could read them, 
Um, and I always dislike talks where people just read the slides that they present to you. Um, so first I'm gonna really present a couple of studies on choice, how important choice is. Behavioral choice theory obviously is about choice. Um, and two studies I'm gonna present are both from Wolfgram and they're both um, animal studies. The first study looks at alcohol in choice and the, and the, um, the rats were randomized to um, a situation where they, they had two water bottles in their cages. And some of the times there was water for the controls, there was always water. For the intermittent choice, there was sometimes water, sometimes alcohol. For continuous free choice, there was always water or alcohol. And then for the forced intake, there was always only alcohol. They did this for 32 weeks. So if the animals who only had alcohol in their cages were going to remain in fluid balance, they were going to be drinking a lot of, a lot of alcohol. Then they clean them up. And of course, it's easier to do that with rats than it is with humans. Um, and they made sure that they were going through withdrawal. And then they give them access to alcohol. So this was the self-administration test. Now, if becoming, um, if developing reinforcement to alcohol is solely based on how much you do of it, then the animals in the forced intake would find alcohol more reinforcing. However, if choice is important, um, then the animals who had choice would find it to be more reinforcing. And here's what you find. Here are the controls, and the controls are the animals who only had access to water for the 32 weeks. And this is their first experience with alcohol. And maybe some of you can remember your first experience with alcohol. You know, your parents went away, but you knew where the liquor was in the liquor cabinet, and a couple of friends came over. <laughs> um, or you, you were in high school, and you went behind the, the school, and you got a six-pack. And usually, it's not all that pleasant. Um, and it wasn't for these animals. They didn't, really didn't take very much alcohol, but they didn't, the, the forced animals didn't take any more than the controls. Forcing the animals for 32 weeks to take alcohol didn't make it reinforcing. What made it reinforcing is if they did it by their choice. Intermittent free choice made it more reinforcing and continuous um, free choice made it all even more reinforcing. Let's look at another example of that same thing. This is with opiates, same idea, control, choice, or forced intake of an opiate. Did it for 30 weeks, cleaned them up for 19 weeks, and they said, who wants opiates? <laughs> Here's what they found, the same thing. The control animals didn't want it. The forced animals who were forced to take a drug for 30 weeks did not want it if they had a choice. The only animals who wanted it was free choice. And this is really interesting set of studies, but it also points out that oftentimes when we try to force people to do things, um, they, they won't want to do it when you, when you take the force away. They won't find it reinforcing. You probably can't make somebody motivated to do something by forcing them to do it. Um, and, and I think many physicians know that when they prescribe and they tell people you have to do this, you have to do that. Um, uh, there's a, about a 50% non-adherence non rate to, to most drugs. Okay. Um, the other part of choice that's important is what are the alternatives? Usually when we think about um, reinforcement, we think about the things that somebody wants to do, not what else is available. I'm going to present two studies that talk about the importance of alternatives. This is a study from Ellsmore, 1980. Um, and these baboons had access to heroin or food. And these, they already become dependent on heroin. Um, and many of you think that after someone is dependent on a drug that they will do anything to get access to the drug. And you often hear that, that these drugs take over people's lives. Um, so in this study, they varied the um, time intervals between access to either the choice of food or heroin. So they could either get it every two minutes, every four minutes, every eight minutes, every 12 minutes. This is sort of an income experiment. So when it was two minutes, the animals didn't have much of a difference. Um, they chose um, food or heroin just about equally. 
but as the choice became more dear, um, as the animals had less money to spend, so to speak, um, they tended to really decrease their um, choice of heroin, but their choice of food hardly changed. So when food was an alternative, uh, they chose it. Show you a really nice example from Vermont, from Steve and Warren Bickle and John Hughes. In 1994, they were studying cocaine use. Um, these were um, people who already had abused, had shown um, cocaine use. They gave them a choice in a controlled situation of do you want cocaine or money? This first slide is just to show you that when they had the choice to get cocaine, they all wanted them. Then they did the experiment where they started to provide a choice. You can have this or that. The idea is to see how reinforcing is cocaine in comparison to alternative reinforcer. And you can see there's almost a linear relationship. On the left is there's no money, only cocaine. Everybody chose cocaine. But as soon as you started to provide alternatives, the cocaine choice decreased. And when you provided the maximal amount of alternative, there was no more cocaine choice. Really clearly showing that even for powerful drugs of abuse, alternatives can alter choice. This is a slide from the American Heart Association um, talking about one alternative to exercise. <laughs> That's being sedentary. This is early in the day, so most of you are not thinking about sitting back in your recliner, but if this was 4 or 4.30, <laughs> many of you would be thinking about that. Well, nice beer and a recliner, that sounds really pretty good. So um, this, the, the next part of the talk is really on these ideas of choice. You can either be active or you can be sedentary. We think about elasticity, um, how much consumption changes as price increases. And we also think about complements and substitutes, primarily in this case, of course, substitutes. Uh, this is Dagwood. Dagwood was in one of our very early exercise programs. And he had to um, make a, make a um, pledge to be more active and tell his family about what his activity was going to be. So he's really optimistic now. I think I'm going to take a walk. But there's his couch, <laughs> which he spent many hours of pleasant time on. And he even's talking to it. You're not getting me tonight, couch. I'm going to go out for my walk. Oh, no, Dagwood. <laughs> it got me. I, I bet you many of us have felt that way, where you wanted to do something, but you had a habit of doing something else, and the other thing got you. Many people have said they're not going to eat junk food, they're not going to eat high energy dense food. They walk past the bakery, take a little bit of a sniff, and boy, that smells good. <laughs> I think I'll just try a donut. I'll start my diet tomorrow. We've developed a way to measure exercise reinforcement in the lab. Same way we measure food reinforcement, the same way basic scientists measure um, drug reinforcement. We use progressive ratio schedules of reinforcement. People cannot um, exercise prior to the assessment. Um, people, the schedules change as people start to meet the response criteria. We compare this to reinforcing value of alternatives, usually other sedentary behaviors. And there's a lot of similar constructs um, that people have talked about, reward, incentive salience, hedonics, one thing. We're really talking about how hard will, will someone work to get access to an exercise, whether it be an exercise bike, access to an exercise facility. Um, I'm going to show you a really cute little um, video of food reinforcement and how powerful food reinforcement can be. I'm hoping I can. I can't. Okay. That's okay. We know that exercise activates the mesolimbic um, reward pathways. Both animals and humans will work to get access to exercise. And there's genetic research starting to get a handle on 
what's the genetics of voluntary um, motivated physical activity in the, the TAC A1 allele of the BRD2, the dopamine D2 receptor um, is important. And that's something that we've studied for food reinforcement. And we have colleagues who have studied it for exercise reinforcement. Very first study we ever did on exercise reinforcement was with kids. Uh, we know that kids who are overweight are less likely to be active. We wanted to see if that was due to differences in the reinforcing value of, of activity. We had three groups of kids, non-obese, moderately obese, and very obese. And they could work either for um, being active or a highly preferred sedentary activity, playing video games. On the bottom, you can see the different schedules of reinforcement as they got harder. Um, and um, we're looking at how much time they spent being active, working for activity. You can see um, when the schedules were the same, when they both required two um, lever presses, um, in this case, mouse presses, um, to get access to the activity or the sedentary, they all chose to be sedentary. When you started to put constraints on that, when it started to become a little bit heavier, not unbelievably heavier, but a little bit heavier, um, to, harder to get activity, you could see the non-obese automatically switched over and became active. When it became a little bit harder, then the, non, the moderately obese switched over. The very obese, it didn't matter how hard it was to work to be sedentary versus active. They still chose to be sedentary. So they work 16 times harder to be sedentary than to be active. And they still chose that. Um, act, being active was just not a reinforcer. So if you're dealing with a situation where you have a very, very powerful reinforcer and people will not make the other choice, maybe one approach to that is reducing access to that reinforcer. And we've already talked about alternatives, how alternatives can help change behavior. So we decided to do a couple of experiments on reducing um, access to sedentary behaviors. Um, one of the first experiments was one of our treatment studies. We have a long history of doing randomized controlled studies with childhood obesity. In this study, we had children from 61 families randomized to our traditional diet and either instructions to increase their activity, to decrease their sedentary behavior, or to do a combination of both. And we had four months of treatment and 12 months of follow-up. The increased activity goals were to go from 30 to 1500, 300 to 1500 calories a week, or to decrease their sedentary behavior down to 15 hours a week. And 15 hours a week is about, at that time, what the, um, the American Academy of um, Physicians was um, saying was appropriate for um, physical, act, physical act, uh, sedentary behaviors in kids. Since then, it's been reduced a little bit. Here's what we found, both in terms of overweight change and fat change. The people who did the best at 12 months were the ones who were in the decreased sedentary group. We show the typical kinds of increases in weight for the exercise and combined groups that we often see, but we saw no increase in weight for the next four months for people who were only in the decreased sedentary behavior group. So you might ask, well, how does that happen? Why would that be? And if you remember the very first experiments I presented to you on choice is the way you establish something as a reinforcer is by giving people a choice of doing it. You can nudge them in one way or the other, but choice is critical. In this case, um, when you decrease sedentary behavior, kids have a choice of what to do with their free time. They're not going to sit in front of the television that's not working. They're gonna do something else. <clears throat> And at that time, really the only sedentary behavior um, to be worried about was television. Now, <laughs> it's a different story, of course. So look at this. Who liked physical activity more? The kids in the exercise group liked it a little bit more. The kids in the combined group liked it a little bit more, but the kids who really liked it were the ones who were, who were um, told not to be sedentary. 
because all the activity they got, all of it was their choice. In the other two groups, the activity was because we were telling them to do it, not necessarily because there was their choice. And this fits the Wolfgram idea just perfectly. So another study we did with um, four to seven year olds trying to prevent the development of obesity was to reduce television watching. Television watching um, is important perhaps for two reasons. One, um, you can eat in front of the television. And secondly, um, television may interfere with being physically active. So we did a study where we used something called the TV allowance and it was a de device we could put on TV. So we went into people's homes and we started to set um, TV guidelines. So in the beginning, um, they could only watch an X number of hours per week. And you can see we got it down from about 25 hours to less than 10 hours. And we were able to do that for an entire year. And this nice thing was this was a device that did this. This had big effects on body weight. Now, the, the interesting thing about this experiment, it was not, the parents were not told this was a weight experiment. We never mentioned weight. We never mentioned eating. We never mentioned physical activity. The only thing we said was, which parents want to help their kids watch less TV? This was a stealth experiment. We got big decreases in body weight. And we never talked about eating. <laughs> we never talked about weight. We only talked about the benefits of watching less television. When we look deeper into this data though, we found out that this effect was due not to increased activity in kids, but rather decreased intake in kids. And in a, a subsequent set of experiments, we were able to show that by doing this, we're able to decrease energy intake by 350 calories or more per day, which would be um, over half a pound a week of weight change. So this effect was due primarily to changes in eating, not activity. And there's a lot of research now showing that reducing access to sedentary behaviors has its major effect on eating, not on increasing physical activity. So if that's the case, then what you wanna to try to do is make exercise more reinforcing. You wanna sensitize exercise exactly the same way that we think about sensitizing drug reinforcement. We wanna make something more reinforcing. We know that, extra, that reinforcement is a dynamic process. It can change over time. If you can increase the value of it over time, then we think about sensitization. There's a lot of drugs of abuse that sensitize. Um, palatable high energy dense foods, sensitized. The initiation of sensitization involves the VTA. Expression of sensitization involves the nucleus accumbens. In general, in drugs and in food, sensitization is related to large doses of a drug and intermittent subsequent presentations of the drug. And this will be important as we get into the exercise um, literature. So one question to ask, if we do an exercise task in the lab and we get different amounts of exercise reinforcement, so people work differently, some people work really hard to get access to exercise, some people don't, is that related to their amount of physical activity? And we'd shown that for kids in two different studies and Kyle Flack, a colleague of one of my, um, one of my colleagues, I'm Jim Remick, um, studied this in um, adults. They studied 88 people. They measured reinforcing value of both physical activity and of aerobic exercise and of resistance exercise. And this just looks at the relationship between reinforcing value and aerobic exercise. And it was significant. And this looks at the um, relationship between um, um, exercise reinforcement of uh, and resistance training, and that was significant. So this suggests that exercise is not a uniform construct, which of course, we really know that, that there's different kinds of exercise. Some people will find one reinforcing, some people will find a different type reinforcing. 
So then I'm going to present a series of studies to see if we can make exercise more reinforcing. How would you do that? So they took sedentary, this particular study took a 104 sedentary men and women. They ended up um, randomizing them to different groups, 89 people completed. They had five, 50 to, or 300 calorie uh, burning sessions three times a week or control. Did this for six weeks and four weeks of follow-up. So um, 50 calories is not very many calories to burn. Um, 300 is more. Um, 300 would be the equivalent of three miles of running for a 150 pound person. And they did it three times a week. They trained at self-selected intensity. Um, and they, used, they were able to establish that by a, um, a, a, a sensor monitor. So here's what they found. Um, the top graph is reinforcing value of exercise. This is reinforcing value of sedentary behavior. And this is the relative reinforcing value that the reinforcing value of exercise decreased. <laughs> it didn't increase, it actually decreased. The reinforcing value of sedentary behavior decreased in people who were in the exercise programs. It didn't change for the controls. Um, so this really wasn't a success. This small amount of exercise a couple of times a week didn't make exercise any more reinforcing. So the second experiment, this time they had them exercise two or six days a week or a control, did it for 12 weeks. Now they had bigger workloads, a thousand calories per session for two days or six days of 400 calories. Um, so once again, the, if you figure running, this is about four miles for a 150 pound person. For a 300 pound person, it's gonna be obviously two miles, uh, but they did six days a week. These guys were exercising um, only two days a week, but they burned a lot of calories in each of those sessions. This is equivalent to 10 miles of running in a session for a sedentary person. Um, so it's a lot of exercise. One of the challenges in this study, and they didn't realize this until they um, looked back at their data, was the, they all reported being sedentary. But when they actually measured their activity using accelerometers, so MVPA stands for moderate to vigorous physical activity. If you look at the minutes of MVPA, everybody was already active before they started. The lowest was this two day per week group and that was 243 minutes a day, uh, I'm sorry, a week, which averages to over 34 minutes a day, which would not place them in the sedentary group. So when they were dealing with people who were more active than they thought. Um, <clears throat> and this is what happens to the changes, it was almost significant. The six day per week group that were exercising 400 calories a day every day increased their exercise reinforcement. The two day a week did not, and the control did not, and it was almost significant. So that was a hint that the exercise daily is going to be better than um, less often, but even at higher workloads. I'm sorry, higher energy expenditure. Um, this looks at the changes pre to post um, in exercise reinforcement um, and physical activity and exercise reinforcement was a strong predictor. So the people who found exercise more reinforcing who increased their exercise reinforcement more exercised more over the um, study. So that was a really good hint that they might start to be onto something. The third experiment. So now they're recognizing that you have to exercise pretty much regularly in order to increase your, um, your exercise reinforcement to find it to be more motivating. So now they were studying the amount of calories per session. So this is five days a week at burning 300 or 600 calories per session. 
So once again, 600 calories a session for a 150 pound person is six miles. So it's a lot of work, five days a week. They're burning 3000 calories per week. Of course, if they were heavier, if they were 200 pounds, it would be less than that. But the frame of reference I always use is for a 150 pound person, a mile of running or walking is 100 calories and it's directly proportional to your body weight. <clears throat> Once again, they used um, objective measures to make sure that people are burning that number of calories, but they let people do it on their own. So they did not require a certain amount of work on a treadmill, for example. They just made sure that people did burn those number of calories. When they started to um, look at the outcome, this is the change in reinforcing value for the 300 calorie session. Small change. This is a change in exercise reinforcement um, for the 600 calorie session. More. Reinforcing value of sedentary behaviors decreased. Um, and this was a significant difference. So this is the first time they were able to show that they're able to increase the reinforcing value of exercise. I'm sorry, this is the relative reinforcing value. This is the reinforcing value of exercise. Went up a little bit, but it went up a huge amount in the 600 calorie group. Even though they're working so much harder, <laughs> it obviously was activating their brain dopamine systems more and it produced much bigger change. The um, reinforcing value of sedentary behaviors decreased and they decreased more in the um, higher energy expenditure group. So the, the um, Flack and colleagues um, had been collecting genetic information from all of these studies. And in, in this study, they were able to show, this is the change in um, the log Pmax of exercise, the reinforcing value for the 300 calorie group a little bit, for the 600 calorie group a lot, highly significant. And this was due in part to SNPs related to the DRT2 receptor, just as um, happens with food reinforcement. The fewer D2 receptors, this TAC-A1 allele codes for the number of receptors, the fewer receptors, the less reinforcing. The more receptors, the more reinforcing. And so if you have um, fewer receptors, you have to engage in more of the activity to get the same amount of activity of, of, of reinforcement. So then we started to do a series of studies on interval training versus traditional aerobic exercise. <clears throat> so interval training is very popular now, high intensity interval training. It's popular for a couple of reasons. Um, one reason is it takes a lot less time. Um, another reason is the intensity is different. It's much more intense. And it's short intervals of really intense exercise. There's now a lot more research on interval training um, than there was um, when we first started doing this. Um, and it's turned out to be very, very positive. Our first study was in 2009. <clears throat> In this study, um, we took 32 kids. We gave them an exercise test, and we then were able to establish um, their work to get their heart rates up to certain um, levels. And we did this um, at two different tasks, above and below the ventilatory threshold. And we did that because there had been a lot of research at that time showing that the affective response to exercise differs above and below the ventilatory threshold. So we wanted to see if the reinforcing value also differed. So um, above the ventilatory threshold, um, they either had a continuous um, activity or they exercised for intervals, 20 seconds, above and then um, 20 seconds below and continuously repeating that um, 
For the below, they were exercising for 20 seconds, so heart rate at 140. Um, and they did the same pattern. So it was much, it was less, um, it was much less um, intense. And then after they experienced these two different protocols, we then, they got a free choice session, either above or below the ventilatory threshold. Results turned out beautiful. Um, you're looking here at this is above or below the VT, and this is either how reinforcing they work for interval or continuous exercise. In fact, the differences between um, the reinforcing value were more pronounced above under hard working conditions than they were below. But in both cases, reinforcing value was greater for the interval training than for the continuous exercise. Pretty cool. Once again, we're pointing at the intensity being an important part of this. So then we did a much more carefully controlled um, set of studies. Just published this. Um, looking at this in adults. The first experiment, we wanted to see how reliable this effect was because these are all single, um, th these experiments were all single session experiments. So we wanted to make sure that if you did it again and again, you'd get the same kinds of effects. So in the first experiment, people did the, the sessions twice and they're basically randomized to a one to one or one to two minutes of interval training to um, moderate intensity aerobic exercise. And the purpose of that was to see if they just preferred interval training because it took less time than the aerobic training. And it, generally it takes a half to a third the time to do an interval training session as it would do to burn the same number of calories or to get a fitness effect for aerobic training. So they sampled both um, protocols. They did a five minute warm up. They sampled the protocols in counterbalanced order. And this was after a fitness test to establish the workloads. And the HIT protocol was 30 seconds at 80 to 90% of heart rate reserve. Heart rate reserve is just your resting heart rate minus your max heart rate. Um, so that's a high workload. <laughs> If you tried interval training or if you've kept your heart rates, uh, working 80 to 90 percent of heart rate reserve is high. Then they got 30 seconds of easy. Um, 30 to 40 percent is, is really easy, and they repeated that time and again. The moderate intensity aerobic exercise protocol had them working at 50 percent of their heart rate reserve, which would be, um, you know, not a walk but an easy kind of a jog. Okay, so we then looked at the reinforcing value in both sessions and liking of the two kinds of exercise. And as you can see, the reinforcing value of HIT was higher than aerobic exercise the first time we did it. It even grew, maybe an example of sensitization the second time. The correlation between the um, reinforcing value for interval training was between the two times was 0.96, it's 0.72 for the aerobic exercise, and they liked it better. Pretty cool, we thought. Okay, so the, the next experiment was to replicate that um, with collecting more measures. Um, not only measuring reinforcing value, but also measuring um, enjoyment, measuring the um, perceived exertion, measuring the, their um, preference for um, high intensity um, work. Same kind of thing, same workloads. Here's what we found. Um, this is the reinforcing value. 
much higher. There's liking, higher. There's the affect, higher. And also, the, are they, they perceive this as more intense. The RPE, the rating for perceived exertion, was higher. So even though the rating for perceived exertion was higher, the workload was higher, they, they found it more reinforcing, and they had a better affective change. All of this is consistent with what you would think would be the case if you're thinking about drug sensitization, um, where higher doses of drugs um, lead to greater sensitization. When we do food reinforcement sensitization experiments, and we've done several of them, the very first experiment, um, we had people consuming a small or large amount of their preferred snack food, um, and they did it for two weeks. And the people who, who ate a small amount of their preferred snack food did not increase the reinforcing value of food. The people who had a large amount did. Okay, so let me summarize um, that we think that exercise can be thought of as a reinforcing stimulus. People will work for access to it. We've shown that in our lab, um, in multiple experiments, and people all over the world now have shown the same thing in humans and animals. Um, we think it is a choice, but we think that just reducing access to sedentary behaviors is not sufficient necessarily to increase people's activity. And as we start to think about exercise as a reinforcer and how to sensitize it, we're getting the idea that intensity or, or the, the amount of work you do in a bout, as well as the frequency you're doing it, is very important. And it looks to us like doing it irregularly, um, even if it's a high intensity, is not going to work. Doing it regularly at very low intensities is not going to work, but it looks like it's some combination. And I just want to mention that um, when we first started thinking about this, we thought this was a behavior you need to shape. You need to do it gradually. You need to do small amounts of it. And the more we think about exercise as a reinforcer, the more we think that that might not be the right approach. Maybe you need to think about it the way you would think about a drug sensitization. So um, thank you for your attention. I'm really excited to hear some questions and comments and ideas. Anybody have any comments or questions? I do see one comment in the chat here from Will Middleton. So he's wondering what aspects of choice influence reward. Many people begin exercising because of societal pressures or fears of worsening health, which may be similar in effect to being told to exercise. <laughs> um, I think this research is such in its infancy I don't think we have any clue, but I'm sure that forcing somebody to do it is not going to make it reinforcing. I'm sure that's the case. How you engineer choice, I think is critical. Um, and many of you are in situations where you're, um, you know, you, you supervise people or you're the head of something or Steve is the head of this whole program. Um, I think the best way to get people to do something is oftentimes to um, set up the situation so they do what you want them to do, but they felt like it was their choice as opposed to you forcing them to do it. And I think the same applies to individual people's behavior, but I do not, um, I do not have the answer to that right now. All right, and so we have another comment here from Rhiannon Wiley, and she says, have you considered the secondary reinforcers that may come with exercise? For example, doing exercise in groups with friends that they enjoy spending time with. We have studied that. We have studied the reinforcing value of exercise in a solitary versus a group setting. And as you might guess, <laughs> it's much more reinforcing if there's a group of people doing it with you. Um, 
Yes, and, and we think that also applies to families, that um, if a family exercises together, I think it's gonna be more reinforcing for everyone than if they do it um, <coughs> separately. But we've already, we've already found that is definitely true. And I think there are other secondary aspects to exercise. Um, I mean, people feel better, they're able to do more. Um, and I, I, I think there's a study showing that um, the reinforcing value of other things in people's lives increases more um, if exercise is done in the morning than later in the day. I can't recall who did that study. Um, but if you think about secondary reinforcers, maybe people who exercise earlier in the day are able to have that positive affect go across many more things than if it's the last thing you do in the day, for example. All right, excellent. I see some questions are coming in on the Q&A as well. So we have one from Mark Feinstein. Uh, very much enjoyed your presentation. And he says, how do you think these effects would hold up with weight training and lifting as opposed to steady state cardio or high interval intensity training? Um, <laughs> I, I think they would hold up perfectly. We, we've not studied CrossFit yet. We've done the traditional kinds of aerobic exercise. But people who do CrossFit absolutely love CrossFit. They're highly motivated to do it. And CrossFit is some combination, isn't it, of some kind of resistance training and more traditional aerobic training. I think that'd be a, a really cool study to do. Um, and one of the earlier slides I presented showed that some people find aerobic exercise more reinforcing. Some people find resistance exercise more reinforcing. So I think if we could ferret those two things out and do the resistance training in exactly the same format, we, we could show the same kinds of effects for resistance training as we're showing for aerobic training. But that's a super, a super question and a great idea for future research. Yeah, there's obviously a big social element involved in CrossFit as well. CrossFit has a lot of social, yes. All right, so looking at another question here, we have from Amy Welch. So a lot of exercise affect research indicates that high intensity exercise is unpleasant during the activity, but as your research indicates, remembered afterwards as enjoyable. Do you think post-exercise affect is more important in reinforcement of the behavior than during exercise affect? Yes, yes, the opponent process theory, Solomon's work, yes. I, I think that's, that's exactly right. If you plot affect um, in an exercise bout, including our I didn't present those slides, but we've done, we've shown that same thing, that the, the affect decreases during the interval training. As soon as you stop, it goes up and it goes up way higher than before you started. Um, yes, I, I, I think that's definitely true. And that's a great example of Solomon's opponent process theory. All right. And then we have, let's see, a comment from Sully Coleman. Says, thank you for your presentation. Is there any evidence that people with versus without substance use disorders become sensitized to the reinforcing effects of exercise at different rates? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I don't have any data on that, but animal research suggests that exercise can reduce drug self-administration in animal models. And there are people who believe that exercise can become an important part of a drug treatment program, um, wouldn't it be, I, it wouldn't be cool that if you were addicted to cocaine that you find exercise <laughs> more reinforcing. That wouldn't be cool. Um, but it would be scientifically interesting, wouldn't it? Um, I, yeah. I don't, I've never seen that study, but I could see how you could think about it that way. I mean, there are definitely treatment approaches of exercise for substance use. Yes. That, that definitely is the thing that's been tested. But I don't know if someone's looked at the reinforcing effects of those two things simultaneously. Yeah, where different kinds of drugs lead to different kinds of sensitization of exercise. That is a super interesting question. All right, so let's see, moving on here, we have um, a question. For any data regarding BMI ranges for, for these people, so higher BM versus normal BMI? Um, all of these studies, there's a wide range. They weren't only lean or they weren't only obese. Um, in, in other studies that I did not show you, in, including the very first exercise study I showed you, that in general, lean people find exercise more reinforcing. 
but in these sensitization studies, they were not selected for, um, for the exercise increased reinforcement studies. They were not selected for body weight. My guess is, is that leaner people will show this more, but I, I haven't, we don't have data on that yet. So it's at least not restricted to the leaner people. No, it's not. All but you, right. can, you can imagine that doing this amount of work for an overweight sedentary person is going to be a lot harder. <laughs> I mean, 10,000 calories. Can you believe that in a session? Um, but yeah. Um, so I think the, the, the leaner person um, who, who is a little bit more active is going to be able to do it easier. But maybe easier isn't important. I, I don't know. All right. So we have one uh, just general comment. So we have an anonymous person stating that their husband used this worked for UPS and had to walk and carry packages. In the beginning, it was almost impossible. And now six months, he has to continue doing physical activity on the weekends to actually feel good. <laughs> so just, a, just an example there of the, uh, you know, developing the reinforcing effects of exercise. <laughs> Isn't that so interesting? On. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so I have another question from Eli Klemperer. Uh, he says, thanks for great talk. Smoking research has found that factors associated with initi initiating an attempt to change, i.e. quit, differ from factors associated with maintaining change, i.e. long-term abstinence. Do you have any sense as to whether this translates to exercise? Do factors that promote initiating differ from factors that promote continuing? I was just thinking about this yesterday. No, I have no, all of this research is really in its infancy. There's no follow-up studies done to see what these people who increased their exercise reinforcement and became more active did six months later, a year later. Um, but the, I, I, my guess is, um, is that it's after they find it reinforcing, they'll start to rearrange their life to make sure they keep getting it. But I don't have that data. All right. Let's see. Okay, so we also have a comment here from Larry Rediger. Any thoughts about how this may be related to mandates for wearing masks? I see some <laughs> comments about forced behavior versus choice behavior. Um, no, I'm not going to get into that at all. Um. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right, and we also have one general question from Leva Khan. What got you interested in this research? So, how did what started you around the topic of exercise and reinforcement of exercise? Well, um, I, I guess in part because I love to exercise myself. So it was interesting for me to study something that I like to do. Um, but in our work with overweight kids, we found out very quickly that these children um, do not engage in very much voluntary activity. The activity they engage in is forced so we want, really wanted to understand um, how to get kids to be more active as part of our obesity treatment programs. Um, since then, of course, it's led to an interest just in exercise, independent of how exercise is important for obesity research. But I, I think it's cool when you can study a topic that's important to you personally. Len, I have, I have a question for yes. you. I, don't, I hope you can hear me. And uh, yes, first, let me apologize for being late. And the, the part of the, the presentation I heard was terrific. So thanks for, for sharing the information with us. I find myself like you, I love exercise and I love interval training, although I don't do as much of it these days as, as I did one time at one time. But I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on the opportunity to gain mastery? So, you know, an interval session that you complete gives you this sense of, wow, I was on the edge and I did it. More so than more moderate exercise. Have you pondered that at all? I, I think that mastery is important, yes. I think that um, interval training also um, has variety in it. If you're doing, if you're going out, or, or treadmill, if you run on the same speed uh, it, without an incline, for 30 minutes, there's not any variety. I mean, it's not terribly exciting. Whereas interval training has a lot of variety in it. Um, the, the other thing about interval training that's different than the traditional aerobic training is if you think about drug reinforcement, we, we know that drug reinforcement is maximal when there's a rapid 
uh, change in something. Mm -hmm. um, whereas a slow release of a drug doesn't produce the same right. um, rewarding effects as a rapid increase. And interval training, which has doing you know 80 or 90 percent um, for 30 seconds, gives you a really big burst. And then you go back and you get another big burst. So I think those continual deltas um, are important in, in why interval, tra interval training is reinforcing. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think that um, the, the, the increased variety, um, and I think mastery is important in all kinds of, of activity. And I, I think that's why triathletes can maintain so much exercise because they're doing three different things and learning three different things and trying to master three mm -hmm. different things. And they're never going to get bored. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. All right. Well, I think that is all the questions that I see in the Q&A in the chat. And I just have to say, Len, thank you. This has been excellent. I always enjoy hearing you talk. And it's, you know, it's very obvious that this is an area that you are passionate about. And it's so much fun. I really. Um, but if anybody is interested in collaborating, um, if this sounds like it'd be interesting for a clinical approach um, or for, um, you know, just um, understanding more about um, how exercise works, um, let me know. I'd, I'd love to collaborate. So thank you. Yeah. Let me, let me thank you again, Len. This, this was outstanding. And I, and I wouldn't just underscore so important for health. I mean, if we can figure out how to make exercise more reinforcing I for know. people, the, the implications are tremendous. Oh, so that's excellent. the holy grail, Steve, isn't it? That's the holy yeah, grail. Yes, it is. <laughs> yep. So many ways. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep.